Hello, everyone. Welcome to our webinar, Sanit Action, Understanding Camper Sanitation Regulation Challenges. Uh, welcome to everyone. Good morning, good afternoon. Um, this webinar is a collaboration between International Water Association and uh, Water Links. My name is Sika Radiova. Uh, I'm Senior Project Officer, Diversity, Inclusion and Equality at uh, International Water Association, and I will be moderating this webinar today. I'm going to go through some housekeeping rules before we kick in with presentations. It's just going to take a few minutes. Um, some webinar information. This webinar will be recorded and made, made available on demand on the IWA website with, with presentation slides and other information. The speakers are responsible for securing copyright permissions for any work that they will present of which they are not the legal copyright holders. And all the opinions, hypotheses, conclusions or recommendations contained in the presentation and other materials are sole responsibilities of the speakers speakers and do not necessarily reflect IWA opinion. We have a chat box um, on, uh, on Zoom. Uh, please use this for general uh, questions and for interactive activities. And also we have Q&A box. This one, please use for uh, to send your question to the panelists. Uh, we will answer this during the discussion, either in writing or in the end, uh, there will be a Q&A session. Uh, please note that the raise hand option is not going to be used in this webinar, so do not use it because we're not going to take it into consideration. We're going to start with uh, a poll. We would like to uh, introduce the poll and ask you where are you joining from. Please do let us know so we know the demographics of um, our audience. We have the results. So we have um, quite a few participants from Europe. I think that's the largest percent, 31% uh, participants from Europe, 26% from Africa, uh, South Asia and East Asia and the Pacific both have 20% each participation and North America, we have 3%, which is understandable because of the time zone. I'd like to introduce our panelists today. We have my floor from Water Links, Suresh Ruhila from International Water Association, Abdullah Al Mayit from CUIS, FSM Support Cell, and Patrick T. Uh, regulatory Office, the Philippines. Uh, our agenda today is on the screen. That's going to be the, the order that the presentations will go on. Uh, and now I would like to present our first speaker, Suraj Kumar Ruhila. Suraj Ruhila is a program lead at the International Water Association on the Initiative Inclusive Urban Sanitation based in London. He has long been an advocate for promoting sustainable sanitation, water sensitive design and planning and, uh, and then decentralized water waste management for environmental sustainability in global South cities. I would like to uh, ask you to join me in welcoming Suraj. The floor is yours, Suraj. Thanks, Sika. Good morning to all participants and good afternoon and evening wherever you are joining. And uh, it is my pleasure today to present the at the first uh, webinar of the Inclusive Urban Sanitation Initiative of IWA. And I would be uh, presenting here uh, some results and lessons learned from a global consultation that IWA had initiated as a part of uh, a smaller project before we started this initiative last year. So uh, today we see that citywide inclusive sanitation approach is recognized by key international players as the way forward for achieving the Sustainable Development Goals 6.2. And citywide inclusive sanitation uh, is defined as a public service approach to planning and implementing urban sanitation systems for achieving outcomes summarized in Sustainable Development Goal 6. Uh, which is safe, sustainable, and uh, sanitation for all, irrespective of where people live within the city or what technologies are used to serve them. The Regulating Citywide Inclusive Sanitation Initiative was a global consultation, and how the project was developed is a collaboration of partners, namely representatives from regulators and organizations across the globe. And we had set up an advisory board and task force to help us do this global consultation. And this document uh, findings, which I'm sharing, is available for download on IW website. And we had, in the process of global consultation, uh, reached out to uh, you know operator uh, regulators from different countries, uh, Kenya, 
uh, Rwanda, Uganda, Senegal, and Zambia, which were starting the CYS transition. And then several countries uh, like Brazil, uh, Argentina, Philippine, where they were ensuring that citywide inclusive sanitation works. And then some uh, cities and countries which reported that they are towards the last leg of citywide inclusive sanitation journey is Chile, Japan, Korea, Malaysia, uh, and Brazil, uh, you know, Colombia. So these were in uh, the globe. Uh, these they were part of the global consultation, and I would like to share the key lessons which came out of this uh, consultation. The uh, consultation was over a year, and uh, uh, it came out that safeguarding safe service provision to all requires a review of utility and regulator mandates, especially in the fast-growing settlements. And data is very essential for utilities for their operating and planning. This is an expensive venture and therefore government should provide and incentivize for data collection and documentation. And another thing important were highlighted in the consultation was that gradual and incremental regulatory measures are feasible, then taking very bold moves. And there is a need, a need for rethinking the role of regulator. I think there have been dynamic changes over the years and the citywide inclusive sanitation approach requires further shifts in the role of regulator. And uh, regulators also require to have uh, sufficient independence and always necessarily being aware of the socioeconomic and the political context. Because uh, what happens is as this context evolves, reassessment is needed for better regulations to serve the people. And citywide inclusive sanitation is something which is not just for low and medium income countries or global south, but it is required in all the contexts, not just, you know, uh, poor countries or uh, low-income countries. So this was also coming out. Another important element which came out from the consultation was that citywide inclusive sanitation has cross-cutting linkages with housing, drainage, and solid waste. This was one of the key learnings that regulators felt that this is an interconnected and interlinked uh, context. Other thing which came out in terms of role and responsibilities in the lessons learned were that uh, sanitation is an integral element of integrated urban water management, and it is the first step to long-term goal of integrated urban water management. And there is a need to adjust the license of public uh, water uh, and sewerage service provider. Uh, now I would like to talk about the initiative which has developed over, uh, as, uh, over the you know, uh, global consultation is the Inclusive Urban Sanitation Initiative of IWA, uh, under which uh, we have organized these series of webinars. And this is the first webinar in that series uh, in partnership with Waterlinks. And as a part of this initiative, we are trying to reshape the global urban sanitation agenda by focusing on inclusive sanitation service goals and the service systems required to achieve them. And uh, we are uh, just not going to be talking about the technology, uh, but we are going to be talking about inclusivity. We are talking about diversity, equity aspects, and uh, focus is not just on expanding sewer networks and treatment works, but it is the holistic citywide inclusive sanitation. We would be engaging further now uh, public, private, and academic sector under this uh, initiative. And uh, we would be defining the goals and fundamentals of public sector approach to service outcomes. And this initiative is being progressed through the Senate Action Campaign, the name given for uh, amplifying the agenda for inclusive urban sanitation and IWA's global call for action on the inclusive urban sanitation. Uh, we would be using uh, different uh, channels of IWA uh, to promote this initiative. Uh, we would be coming out with series of white papers and position papers. Uh, we would be having a series of webinars, MOOCs and learning sessions, blogs and stories to capture the experiences from different geographies and socioeconomic contexts. We would be also uh, launching a special edition of a conference, uh, Innovation Acceleration Conference at the uh, IWA World Water uh, World Congress, uh, which will be held in Kigali in the, uh, 2023. And there will be some innovation awards for the kind of work which we been done by different uh, players involved in promoting inclusive urban sanitation. More details about this initiative can be uh, can be found at IWA website, and there is a barcode here. You can scan and visit our IWA website. And I would stop here. Thank you very much for listening to me. Thank you very much, Suresh, for providing this comprehensive overview and informati informative lessons learned. Thank you. 
Uh, I would like to present uh, our next speaker, uh, who is my floor. She holds a degree in law and economics from the University of the Philippines and over 30 years of work ex experience in the urban water supply and sanitation sector, having, having worked for government, private enterprises and international development institutions. Uh, May is currently the executive director of Waterlinks. Welcome. Thank, thank you, Sikil. Um, I, I wanted to congratulate IWA at the onset uh, for, for a fantastic initiative. I think it is very timely and it is really needed. So that, that's great work that you guys are doing there. Um, Waterlinks is, of course, quite uh, honored to be a, a part of the initiative. Uh, and thank you to IWA for inviting us to, to this session. Um, so Waterlinks is a nonprofit organization that is based in the Philippines, and we've been working uh, a lot with water and sanitation utilities uh, through capacitating programs, primarily for uh, with which I'm presenting on uh, or within our expertise, um, because we have seen how water and sanitation utilities have uh, op operated well, and in some cases not operated well, and we we feel that regulation uh, really can assist in helping uh, utilities uh, ensure better services for their customers. Um, we are working in three countries, essentially Bangladesh, India, and Nepal, um, which are in various stages of reform uh, in regulatory in regulatory reform in the water and sanitation sector. Um, they are, we are currently looking at what has been done, uh, why they want regulation, understanding what the challenges uh, that they are facing and what they feel regulation can do for it in addressing that challenge or those challenges. And of course, coming up with a feasible solution because we all know that one size uh, does not fit all. Uh, while models from Africa, Manila in the Philippines, and Malaysia will be introduced, uh, we have already we already know that we cannot simply copy any of these models uh, because obviously the the um, the situation on the ground in these uh, countries are very different. So just to give you a bit of a background as to the structure of who are the players in terms of service providers in these countries. So in Bangladesh, you have, uh, if you can take a look at the gray, uh, the gray bits, uh, you basically have uh, different types of uh, service providers. You've got the Department of Public so trying to help uh, the, the actual service providers, particularly the city corporations and the Purashavas, uh, so DPHE and LGED typically would develop uh, the treatment plants and turn these over uh, to, to these entities, the city corporations and Purashavas, and uh, also on the rural side for their operations. Uh, then you've got in the middle box, you've got the, the larger service providers in the cities, in the larger cities of Dhaka, Chittagong, Kulna, and Rajshahi. And these are what they call WASTAs or uh, autonomous entities, water and sanitation authorities. And they basically provide services uh, for both water and sewage. Um, and, and this is where um, I take um, I, I take a point from Suresh's presentation when he says that there is a need to adjust the responsibilities of utilities to cover sanitation for all. Because just in the case of Bangladesh, for instance, the issue of um, septage management and fecal sludge management or FSM um, does not fall onto the service providers. It doesn't fall onto the WASA it falls onto the local governments. So the city governments, the Pura Shavas and the like. Um, and this is a bit of an issue, particular to the cities where wasas exist, because then there seems to be a gray, a gray bit as to who is in charge of that particular one. In Orissa, it's a little bit more straightforward. Uh, you've got two entities that are essentially providing water and separately sanitation services. Water is being provided by a newly uh, corporatized entity, wholly public owned, 
by the government. It's called Watco or the Water Company. And it covers uh, 28 uh, cities or municip cities and municipalities throughout the state of Odisha in India. Um, and they provide primarily water supply. Um, and on the sanitation side, uh, it's the services on sanitation is being delivered by the OWSSB or the Orissa Odisha Water Supply and Sanitation Board, uh, Orissa Water Supply and Sewerage Board. Um, but you will see that um, OWSSB essentially provides the capex. So they develop uh, all of these treatment plants and then they hand it over to the to the municipality or the urban local bodies. The ULB is the municipality, which in turn transfers the operations of these uh, treatment plants to SHGs or self-help groups. In some cases, they also transfer it to WATCO uh, and PHEO. PHEO would be the Public Health Engineering Office uh, for operations, but you will note that WATCO only operates sewerage. So all of FSM still falls within the municipality and uh, thereafter turned to turned over to self-help groups to operate, but report, reporting to the municipality. Um, and in Nepal, uh, it's a little bit more complex. Uh, please take a look at the green bits. Uh, the gr you will see on the left side, the first uh, green bit is KUKL, which is the utility that is providing water and sanitation services to Kathmandu Valley. And then the second green box is the Nepal Water Supply Corporation, which provides water uh, supply, um, water supply, sorry, these two green boxes are only providing water services. So KUKL and Nepal Water Supply are both providing water services. In the case of Kathmandu, uh, of KUKL, it's operating only in Kathmandu Valley. In the case of Nepal Water Supply Corporation, you will take a look at the line, the black line down. It covers 22 municipalities, including the larger cities of Pokhara uh, and, and you know, outside of Kathmandu Valley. Um, sanitation, however, is being provided by local governments. Once again, uh, you will see the next three green lines uh, and the blue lines above it. Uh, these are government uh, essentially uh, municipalities and city uh, offices. So each of these countries are in various stages of reform. Um, in Bangladesh, which was before th this project of uh, that supported by Bill Gates began in 2022, um, Bangladesh was ahead of the pack in a sense, because as early as 2015, the ADB, the Asian Development Bank, uh, had developed a, had provided technical assistance uh, to help the, the country understand regulation better. And uh, they agreed then at that point to develop a water regulatory commission or a WRC. Uh, this was way back in 2015. However, um, from, to, from that time, uh, the status of the WRC is unclear. It never really took off. So there was not much discussion after the, the draft bills were, were made. Um, so recently, ADB has uh, approached again uh, Bangladesh to try to revive this discussion in, in trying to reestablish or go back and review the need for a regulator through either a, a regulatory commission or what have you. Um, and uh, we feel uh, that we should be working uh, alongside ADB in trying to push for this particular reform. So Waterlinks uh, and UNICEF, supported by um, the Bill and Melinda Gates uh, Foundation, is working uh, together with, with ADB, alongside ADB, in trying to assist Bangladesh uh, develop uh, some regulatory arrangements for the sector. But in parallel, we understand that nationally, it's very, um, it's very difficult. And again, I look back to what Suresh said, that having bold moves might be more difficult than having incremental baby steps, in which case we are also exploring uh, what can be done, particular to FSM, regulating FSM in cities. In Orissa, um, that 
state has really done uh, excellent work. Uh, I, we think that the government is very forward thinking. They have uh, some innovative programs. It is the only state in India that has that that has a 24 by 7 water supply in several cities. Uh, at the moment, uh, they have uh, covered the drink from tap program, has covered 100% coverage now in the capital cities of Bhubaneswar, Katak, and Berampur. Uh, and they are covering 350,000 people uh, with 24 by 7 water supply. Um, they have, on the sanitation side, adopted a decentralized and non-sewered community-led fecal sludge and septage management program um, that has that can really be scaled up very quickly. And sewerage, they have decided, is only limited to the larger cities like the capital city of Bhubaneswar. Um, as mentioned, uh, it's also the only state in India to have provided every urban center a septage treatment plant. Over the last few years, they have established and built 108 fully functioning STPs across 107 cities uh, in, in the state. Uh, and eight more will be completed by March of this year, covering all um, urban cities, 114 of them. Um, and now government is now thinking of uh, establishing a statewide regulator to ensure the gains uh, that they have achieved will be sustained. Um, and this is also where Waterlinks has been uh, requested to support, uh, again, through the Gates Foundation. We are working also with um, the Center for Policy Research of India in this, in this state to get this going. In Nepal, um, this, this is now the, I would say at this point, they are ahead of the pack now because in October of 22, they passed a law, uh, the Water and Sanitation Act, which created the water not water, sorry, the Tariff Fixation Commission. Um, and that is now, what, what we are doing with them is to support them to draft laws or regulations, not laws, but regulations to effect that law. Um, and we are hoping that within this year that um, will be completed and a fully functioning regulator will be in place by the end of the year. So prospects for regulation, as mentioned, um, maybe baby steps for Bangladesh at this point, looking at working with the city corporations, both Dhaka South and Dhaka North, to try to craft regulation and arrangements that can address FSM challenges. Um, we, can, we are also looking at, um, uh, these are already existing, citizens charters are already existing, which are annual contracts between city corporations and the government. Um, and we are exploring the possibility of maybe uh, not creating a fully new uh, uh, regulator, but working within the ambit of the citizens charter uh, and coming up with provisions uh, for uh, stricter provisions for targets and um, performance-based services over fixed a fixed period of maybe every three years or every five years. Uh, we would also like to work with the largest um, utility in, in Bangladesh, it's the Dhaka Wasa, um, to elaborate the annual performance agreement. Again, this is the contract between the water utility Dhaka Wasa with the government and, and its constituents to try to use this as a platform for regulation. Um, and again, the, and as a third, uh, so you've got Dhaka Wasa as the utility also Dhaka South, Dhaka North for FSM, and then also looking at a Purashava, one Purashava we have yet to choose uh, to pilot regulatory arrangements there along the lines of the Citizens Charter uh, of the city corporations. In Orissa, uh, like I said, this, the government is very clear. They want a statewide regulator. Uh, and so we are now organizing um, visits for them to both Malaysia and, and Philippines. Uh, and understanding uh, what works, and that will hopefully help them uh, craft the regulations that will affect the, the Water and Sanitation Act that has been passed in October of 2022. Sorry, that's Nepal, my, my mistake. Orissa is simply to develop regulation, and government has uh, really wanting to, to do it, so they are also committed to establish a regulator by the end of the year, and Nepal as well by the end of the year to develop regulation to support the act that has been passed. 
So both Nepal and Orissa are scheduled to visit uh, Philippines and Malaysia. Nepal very soon, uh, by February of uh, 2023. Uh, they will, they, in fact, February 22, they will be in Malaysia and February 27, they will be in Manila. Uh, Orissa would be scheduled sometime in April or May. Um, and as you will see there, hopefully within this year, we will have draft regulations and a framework to affect a, a fully functioning regulator. Uh, in Bangladesh, uh, we're taking it in a little bit slower. We're going to, to meet with the Dhaka North Corporation in March. Um, sorry, that has been changed from February to March um, to try to see uh, what can be done uh, for FSM specifically, and also to discuss with one smaller city or Apura Shava to see what can be done along the same lines on FSM. Um, there are also things that we are looking at on the activities for the three project areas that are common. Uh, we're thinking of a regulatory conference, uh, maybe after the countries have visited uh, Manila and Malaysia. And we're also looking at um, working with the East Africa, East and Southern Africa Water uh, Regulators Association. So that's called ISAWAS. And ISAWAS is, is a very interesting entity from Africa. Those of you who are from Africa know them very well. There are 10 member regulators uh, in ISAWAS and they have a, a very, very rich experience in crafting regulation, what worked, what didn't work. Uh, so we're hoping to also learn from their experience. So from all of these, what we have seen uh, in discussing with the various regulators uh, that are existing, very few, but still there are, uh, they exist in, at least in Asia. Um, uh, and Suresh also mentioned this in his presentation, independence is key. You need to have an independent and autonomous regulator. You will hear from my colleague, Patrick T later, uh, to explain uh, how that very point is important. It has to have a clear mandate uh, to be effective. Um, of course, it has to be staffed by competent and well-trained personnel. Um, and this is really one of the challenges. You may have the best uh, regulator organized, but if the staff are not properly trained or not the right fit in terms of uh, experience and um uh, expertise, then it will also not work. Um, the utilities should also have clear targets uh, that they need to achieve over time. And we feel that this is really the only way uh, for utilities to, to ensure the delivery of services continuously uh, and reaching 100% over time. Um, tariffs as well, a very important point to regulation. It must be linked to service standards and performance, and it cannot simply be in a vacuum that, you know, you, you get a tariff from the air. It must be linked to some form of service standard. Um, a system of incentives and penalties are, is also important for operators to be, you know, mindful of what they, their responsibilities are. And of course, uh, since consumers are at the center of regulation, then the tariffs need to be aff affordable, uh, but without sacrificing uh, the, the um, quality of the services. Um, so uh, that too is, is quite interesting because for instance, in the state of Odisha, they've already stated that we don't need to have full cost recovery, but the state is willing to have some form of gap funding or subsidy. Um, to try to, to meet the gap between what is affordable and what is needed. Um, and of course, finally, a process for filing complaints and dispute resolution um, should also be included in, in the whole structure of regulation. With that, I end my presentation. Thank you very much. Thank you, Mai, for the great presentation. Very insightful and great overview of the region. Um, before I go to the next panelist, I would like to remind uh, our participants that they can place their questions uh, to the panelists in the Q&A box. 
Uh, our next panelist is Dr. Abdul Al Muit. Uh, he is Development Watch professional who has worked for more than 15 years with experience developing and managing large, large scale environmental and water sanitation programs and projects targeting poor and vulnerable population in urban and rural parts of Bangladesh. He is working as Chief Operating Officer of the CUIS FSM support cell of the Department of Public Health engineering. He has authored four textbooks, more than 100 peer-reviewed papers and reports on environmental engaging. Welcome. Thank you, Sikia, uh, for introduce introducing me. I hope you can uh, hear me loud, right? Is it... We can hear you well. Excellent. Okay. Thank you so much. So um, good evening and uh, good afternoon. And um, of course, uh, the good morning, some of the places where you are. So this is Muid, they call me Muid, how my all, all the friends call me. And um, today I'm going to present how the government leadership um, has been enacted towards the journey of SDG 6.2. Just to inform you that, um, uh, I mean, we all the WASH professionals usually do the advocacy from the outskirt of the you know, government. We always say that the government needs to do that. They need to follow that. They have to do these, these, these things. But today's journey is the after that, the implementation of the advocacy. And welcome to the journey of the SWIS FSM support center and how we are implementing the advocacy in the government to lead the SDG 6.2 journey. So I take an adaptation of the story, um, the turtle story here. You all know that story, a little bit of twisted here. There is no rabbit here. So there is no race with other one. It's the only standalone turtle story here. And um, if I uh, you know, recall the story, that's a journey uh, we started long before the MDG period. And at the end of the MDG period, we were so happy, so happy that the journey to zero, we also celebrated at that time that we achieved the open deputation free status uh, country at the end of MDG period. It's a splendid success for the country. And um, however, we were a little bit of relaxed like the turtle is uh, having the ice cream, the delicious ice cream, I wish I have it now. The journey uh, needs to continue after the MDG period and during the SDG period, how we are going to, you know, having our journey is a little bit of, you know, perpetual situation that turtle is very much tired. One of the major reason is the SDG understanding. It takes a long time for us to understand and to comprehend properly the terminology, the work, the task, how we will going to proceed, how we are going to put our footsteps to reach the 2030 journey. So tired turtle is, uh, you know, there during that journey. And if we look at in the uh, 2015 GMP data, rural and urban sanitation in both cases, if you see that, I mean, the uh, safely managed sanitation in the rural case is a 34%, and for the urban case, it was 42%. And in the case, uh, you know, um, uh, of 2015 end of MDG period, uh, as I mentioned, we already, you know, eradicated the open deputation. And um, we also understood at the time that the shared toilet is the reality of this country, which is again a different terminology in the lanes of uh, SDGs. And uh, at the uh, end of few years, if we consider that, like uh, uh, urban sanitation, when we see that the, in 2021, sorry, this was the 15 data and here the 21 data, I mean, 2021 data. So 2020, according to the JMP 2021. So this is something, it's very interesting. For the last, you know, five to seven years, um, there was no increase of the open defecation. And during that SDG period, this is a splendid achievement of the government of the Bangladesh to keep it at a static level. The open defecation free status still now, this is a success. but. This is not enough for reaching a country to reach the SDG target. So safely managed sanitation, how we can reach that. So shared toilet is a problem, 
But open defecation is not an acute problem for this country during the SDG period. Now, if we consider that, so how we are gonna change the landscape um, in Bangladesh? Let's go back what our policy has mentioned. We have the institutional regulatory framework and it has the rural and urban framework there. And in the urban framework, we have the municipality or we say Poroshava, we have 329 Poroshavas and city corporations, the small cities. We have the mega cities like the Dhaka cities as well. And the bigger one, another bigger one is the Chattogram. Um, so considering that aspect, the 329 decentralized small countries, small you know, units of the towns, we have 329 small towns here in Bangladesh. So we have the focus how we are gonna, you know, in a decentralized way, we'll keep our journey for the SDG 6.2. And accordingly, we focused on the on-site sanitation. FSM, um, you know, uh, uh, focused on-site sanitation should be the way how you're gonna reach the journey of safely managed sanitation in a quick way. And accordingly, our national action plan was developed in 2020, and the SOIS FSM support cell has been established in the government uh, of, under the local government division at the end of 2020, where our primary task is to lead these 329 municipalities, also the rural areas, for the safely managed sanitation journey. And we focus on different advocacy agenda. At the beginning, I mentioned that these are the things we need to do by the government. Now we are the responsible person, agency to do it by the government. So we are the, probably this is the only example, so far as I know, globally, the organization which is inside the government but doing the advocacy within the government. And the other things which are very much critical for the journey of SDG 6.2, the capacity building, demonstration and replication of uh, you know, technological innovation. We need to have the financial planning and influence IFIs for the you know, resourcing market for the innovation, monitoring and evaluation and everything. So accordingly, we actually develop our uh, strategy, policy reform, everything for the SDG journey. We, the policy regimes categorize all the 329 Poroshavas and have the plan how we are going to move in the 2025, primarily then post 2025. But beside that, you know, the country is changing, the economic status is changing. Now we are aspiring to become the, not only the middle income countries, maybe more than that. The, GDP has income, uh, you know, in a couple of folds. So the rural transformation we need to keep in mind. The rural areas is not the rural areas we found in the MDG period. It's the some transformative areas, non-poroshovas or non-municipal areas, towns, growth centers. Those are emerging sector where we need to consider. But those are part of the rural areas as well. So considering that aspect, the government has focused on very specific my village, my town project. So this is where our SWIS FSM support cell journey. Now, the how this turtle is moving during this SDG period. Um, of course, considering that aspect, you know, we right, we um, we need to have something to start something. So for which uh, we followed the CWI citywide inclusive sanitation approach. And while this citywide and, uh, inclusive sanitation, sanitation approach, the three pillars, responsibility, accountability, resourcing, these three, we put it as a key priority agenda to be followed by the municipality. Responsibility, by who? The municipality. The accountability, by who? The municipality. Resourcing for the municipality. Now come to the point. If we don't put our emphasis on the resourcing, the responsibility and accountability will not be performed well by the municipality. So we need to go in parallel and very good emphasis, strong advocacy requires for the resourcing. Considering that aspect, um, we, we are doing a stronger advocacy with the IFIs. But the focus of all the journey is how we are gonna reach 150 assets FSCPs or towns in this decentralized way in the next couple of years, how we are gonna having the digital database and monitoring uh, to monitor the progress of the SDG uh, 6.2 and how we are gonna give the urban facilities, those sort of things. While doing so, we found a very 
critical contextual problems. We considered the fecal sludge management. This is a very interesting fact. But if you, in Bangladesh, if you question to any municipal authorities, like which one is your critical problem, fecal sludge or the solid waste? So the solid waste, the answer is the same one. I still now receiving the same answer that if we consider the bar chart, something like that, the solid waste problem is much higher than the fecal sludge problem. So this indicates that, again, the policy says that, the responsibility for both the OS, fecal slug and solid waste, go to the municipal authority. So we and the land is a critical issue in Bangladesh. So in Bangladesh, we have decided to go for the integrated waste management that combines the fecal slug and solid waste together. Of course, this is a major decision for, um, you know, for the government. And um, uh, in order to do that, the resource allocation that we anticipated becomes manifold now. So the SOIS framework we want to develop under this SOIS deliverables and a lot of things, uh, definitely indicators, and uh, we are going to do that. So I, I shall share the, in the next slide. And this sort of thing need to be, you know, uh, accounted in the, through the development of national wash account. That is another endeavor we are anticipating that how much we are, you know, getting from the out of pocket expenditure in the sanitation, we want to capture as well also. Now, uh, these are the problems, but the thing is how we are gonna solve that. I'm not gonna go one by one problem, but two things I would like to say here. One is the first of all, when, when we say SOIS, what is SOIS citywide inclusive sanitation? The authority, of course, didn't we do before SOIS? I mean, for the last 10 years, of course, the city sanitation planning, we did it together with the many of you. And those are the things actually systematically put in the SOIS framework so that we can go in a step-by-step -step process. So two steps, I found that very interesting for Bangladesh. One way to understand the SOIS and to develop the capacity of the SOIS to the municipality, to the government officials and others. So in order to do that, we have developed a complete capacity building programs with the technical university IT and what we say, and that becomes the one hand of the SOIS FSM support cell. They have been given the responsibility to develop the technical modules and to do the uh, training sort of programs across the country. And we are doing it together with the uh, uh, municipal authorities and also the Department of Public Health Engineering. This is number one the robustness of the capacity building program. The second one is how are you going to get data? So this is, if you go to the, apart from the GMP data, you will not find any decentralized data for the individual city. This is very important to give the data by the municipality. That will reflect the accountability. That will reflect the you know, responsibility of the municipality for which we already developed the, the national sanitation dashboard. All of we, you are requested after the you know webinar to visit the www.sandboard.gov.bd. I wish I could show it to you live, but if you go there, you will get their 64 municipalities data. Each of the city's data profile are there. So we are gonna reach 329 municipalities within the next two years, hopefully, if everything goes well. So these two issues are very critical while we are doing the stronger advocacy with the uh, international finance institutions. And the result is very promising. So far, within two years of uh, our journey of the SOIS FSM support center and throughout the advocacy with the, our development partners, already actually 100 million USD has been invested so far. And just last week, we have um, you know uh, the, another very big project which estimated around 250 million US dollar, which was also approved in our uh, ECNIC, we say that the, the apex body of our prime minister. And these are the outcome of the SOIS. And these are all are the SOIS driven projects. And within next two years, one point over five billion dollars will be invested in country and in the DPHE as a SOIS driven project to have the integrated waste management and to develop the SOIS, uh, you know, uh, SOIS deliverable. So this is the resourcing, as I mentioned at the before, the primary pillar of the SOAS framework is very much you know, in progress. The progress here I would like to show you, if you go to the uh, Susanna's website, you will get all the published SFDs there. I'm not going 
to details of there, but the CT's profile are getting that. This is the real scenario, scenario decentralized way. So, uh, you know, the how you are gonna convert this red to green, that is how we are gonna put it. So uh, in the next three to four years of journey, and that in order to reach the 2030 target, the next three to years are very important. The projects I have mentioned are very important. The outcomes will actually govern the reaching of 2030, how the progress of the safely managed sanitation of the situation. However, this sanitation dashboard that I mentioned, it is collaborated with our uh, A2I uh, so that we will, get, we will get the national you know, recognition as well to have the national data source. So this is uh, how we are progressing now. The other one I already mentioned that the capacity building platform, but we need to capture the good stories, particularly in my uh, in the previous presentation and Dr. Suresh also mentioned the particular focus on the waste workers, how we 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 shall you know keep the occupational health and safety, safety, how we have you know the SOIS mentoring city so that the other cities will follow the SOIS learning from the existing mentor cities in the country or you know, uh, within the country so that that can be escalated to 329 municipalities as well. We are developing the uh, different stories also and some of the stories are embedded in the link. I hope that you can read those stories um, after the, you know, uh, the webinar also. The links are already embedded there. And uh, uh, just before, you know, uh, we, I'm just at the end of my presentation almost, so the whole objective of the SOIS FSM support cell is to lead this, you know, SDG 6.2, doing advocacy and having in mind the three pillars, accountability, responsibility, and resourcing. And this has been guided by our APEX uh, document, you know, planning document of the eight five-year plan and under which guidance we are having the journey. And during that journey, we found that the innovative technologies are very important as well. If I do not say any word regarding technology, it will not be you know, justified. So it's not only the, you know, uh, bounded by the uh, omniprocessor or gasifier or pyrolysis unit. I mean, the country like Bangladesh needs those technology, but we need to be very careful as well to introduce you know, the, this sort of technology because of the high operation maintenance challenges are there. So we are very careful to have the innovative technologies, but we are also optimistic that the small, small, you know, occupied landed units of the technology will provide some good solution for the reaching the SDG 6.2. The market opportunity is definitely very positive, but technologies, emerging technologies, contextual technologies as well is very important. And we are going to demonstrate a one omniprocessor in Bangladesh very soon. So the whole objective is to create this ecosystem. It's not the Swiss FSM support cell. We cannot do work alone. So we are working together with our sector partners. Sector partners means all the sector actors like uh, INGOs, NGOs, and their Swiss cities is becoming now channelizing in that government-led projects and in the Swiss FSM support cell, we are ready to answer the what, when, which, how. And we will be happy to capture the good practices by the sector actors and to put it in the government-led projects so that this will be reflected in the pipeline projects that I already mentioned of the 1.5 billion. So this is what we are targeting to achieve. Together with us, I already mentioned one hand is I can wait. The another hand is the Global Water and Sanitation Center, which is located at the AIT, which also helps us to formulate the project, to monitor the project, and all sort of TA sort of work. So this is what my presentation today is, how we are gonna doing advocacy inside the government and how we are gonna implementing those. Some of the policies are embedded with profile link. If you are interested, please go details it later on. And thank you so much for listening to me during the journey of this turtle. And hopefully we, the turtle will finish the touchline in 2030. Thank you so much. Over to you, Sika. Thank you very much, Dr. Muit. Very engaging presentation, highly informative. Uh, great visualization as well with the turtle story. Thank you so much. Uh, now I'd like to present uh, our last but not least um, panelist, Patrick T. 
Patrick is an in, incumbent chief regulator uh, of the Metropolitan uh, Waterworks and Sewage System Regulatory Office in the Philippines. He holds a Bachelor of Arts uh, in Psychology from the Ateneo de Manila Univer University, and he obtained his Bachelor's of of Law's degree from the University of the Philippines College of Law. Welcome, Patrick. Oh, thank you, Sikia. Uh, but uh, I'd just like to thank uh, the Iowa for inviting me as well as our uh, water links. Thank you very much. And uh, good uh, morning, good afternoon, and good evening to all our uh, participants here today. I'm uh, going to talk about the regulatory approach towards uh, achieving citywide inclusive sanitation in Metro Manila in the Philippines. Uh, about who we are, uh, I'm the, we are the MWSS regulatory office and our mandate is basically to set tariff adjustments during uh, the rate rebasing. And the most important one is we monitor uh, the performance of the concessionaires who are providing the water and wastewater services in Metro Manila. Uh, as part of that monitoring, we also can impose penalties. Uh, this is actually the map of uh, the concession area. If you notice, it's split into two. Uh, we have two concessionaires that's providing uh, water and wastewater in Metro Manila. The reason why this was uh, done so uh, is because it will allow us to benchmark each other and to to check on their performance and have a comparative benchmark uh, on their performance. Uh, basically the regulatory framework uh, of the MWSS RO is that we are balancing the interests of the stakeholders. We need to balance the interests of the consumers vis-a-vis -vis the concessionaires or the investors to ensure that uh, the proper service is given. And of course, that the proper incentives uh, will be also given to the investors and for them to be able to recoup their investment. So basically, this is the performance before of the MWSS before privatization, before the two concessionaires took over. Uh, if you can notice, uh, the water supply coverage was at only at this month 48%. Now we are at 94%. So that's the trust, that's the major trust then of my office. But uh, if you notice, the sewer coverage was at this month from 9% to 26%. And that's one of the things that we want to fix right now because only 26% of Metro Manila has sewer coverage. And we need to improve that significantly in the coming years. Uh, in the meantime, what we are providing is sanitation or uh, dislodging services to all the consumers that are not given uh, or not covered by the sewer services of the two concessionaires. Now, the basis for us to provide that service is the Clean Water Act of 2004. If you notice that uh, the law provides that uh, the two concessionaires are supposed to uh, connect the, all of the establishments inside the concession area to the available sewerage system. This is the role of the MWSS and the water concessionaires in Metro Manila that uh, they are they are mandated to provide that water and wastewater services. This is provided by a law. So, and uh, it specifically provides that they need to do this in accordance with their concession agreements. So that's uh, how we are able to uh, require Manila Water and Manila, the two concessionaires, to provide wastewater services in Metro Manila. Of course, uh, providing this service is very challenging. Uh, the four major challenges that we are facing right now are the first is the high investment cost. Of course, it costs more to treat wastewater than treating water for drinking. And the second one is that uh, we have a problem with our infrastructure footprint versus available the availability of lands because Metro Manila is an urban area and it's very congested. The third is the environmental targets versus construction timeline, because we want them to fast track their rollout uh, to make sure that we are have a citywide inclusive sanitation as soon as possible. And the, la the last one is the lack of awareness and the low number of customers availing of this dislodging services. So those are the four major problems uh, that are facing right that we are facing right now. 
So, but we have uh, solutions for this one, for all the problems. The first is the financial restructuring. The second is the best fit innovation, innovative infrastructure system and the rewards recognition mechanism. And the third one is the information, education and communication strategies. Going back to the in finance, to the problems with the uh, high investment cost, we are providing uh, financial restructuring. If you notice, it, uh, on the slide, uh, in this slide, we, before uh, residential customers who are connected to the sewer network needs to pay a 50% of their water bill as their sewerage costs. However, however, this actually led to a problem of the acceptability of this service to the consumers because the consumers, they don't want to pay. If they are connected to the sewers, then they will have to pay additional 50%. So what the MWSSRO did is we restructured the tire structure for sewerage and sanitation. And by 2012, we removed that already. So there's no more sewer charge for residential customers. And we reduced it, the commercial charge for commercials, commercial establishments to just 30%. And we increased the environmental charge to 20% to make up for this uh, reduction. This is to encourage people to avail of these services because a lot of people are not uh, availing or they do not want to get connected because they don't want to pay extra. Now there's no more, uh, there's no more charge for our uh, consumers to be connected, especially residential customers. They no longer have to pay extra to be connected to the sewer network. Of course, we also need to incentivize uh, the two concessionaires to encourage them to increase their sewer connections. And just this last rate rebasing, the MWSSRO approved their business plan and adjusted their tariff structure and granted them an increase of their environmental charge, uh, which will be uh, based on their performance or based on their uh, sewer coverage. So example, uh, in the case of Manila water, their sewer coverage is already above 25%. So we were we allowed them to increase their environmental charge from 20% to 25%. And they are targeting by 2026 uh, a 30% sewer coverage. So by uh, by 2026, we will also increase their environmental charge to 30%. This is to encourage them and to incentivize them to fast track their rollout of their CapEx projects for wastewater. So this will uh, have uh, an effect on their bottom line. For in the case of Manila, the second uh, concessionaire that's, that's providing water and wastewater services in Metro Manila, they're still at 21%. So they will be able to get 25, they will be able to increase their environmental charge to 25% once they have reached 25% sewer coverage in their service area. So this way, there's going to be a uh, an incentive on their part to fast track their uh, rollout of their CapEx projects for wastewater. Since uh, before their, the fo their focus were, was just on water because there is a corresponding revenue for water, but there's none for sewerage. Now we're hoping that this new uh, incentive will convince the two concessionaires to fast track their performance and their rollout of their projects to increase their wastewater coverage. Of course, uh, the real the, the other problem uh, we are facing is that uh, of lack of available lands and the uh, problem of rolling out this uh, this soup, this uh, wastewater treatment plants uh, all, and the other this and all these other projects uh, in order for the proper services to be given to the consumers. So before uh, we have a separate system that's. Connect, that basically a separate system is the households are directly connected via sewer lines to the sewage treatment plants. Uh, since we realized that this is really expensive, well, this is the ideal system for our wastewater management, but this is really very, very expensive. And there's a lot of challenge to construct this. So since uh, there's really no way around providing that system, we basically in the meantime, decided to do a combined system. This allows us to utilize the existing drainage system and to fast track vision of providing sewerage services 
to our uh, consumers. And this can easily be upgraded to a separate system in the future. While in the meantime, we are providing uh, dislodging services or sanitation services to all those customers that are still not covered by the sewer networks. Basically, uh, I think uh, my pre the previous speaker mentioned that they have a plan for 2030. Uh, in Metro Manila, the plan for sewerage coverage in Metro Manila is until 2037 or 2036. That's because that's the end of their concession agreement. So they, are, they have until that time to fast track their service and to build the sewage treatment plant. So hopefully that they will be increasing their uh, sewer serve population by then. Now, uh, in the meantime, uh, that we're building this uh, treatment plants, if you notice, there, we're building a lot of new sewage treatment plants and increasing the capacity. Uh, another issue that we need to address is the best fit in the situation that we have in Metro Manila. We have a lot of uh, areas that needs to be served, but there are not really a lot of available lands. That's why uh, there's really no one size fit all approach in Metro Manila. So sometimes we will accept the fact that there will be areas that will be serviced by a smaller sewage treatment plant, and we have to build more sewage treatment plant to address this. And, and we will be utilizing different technologies depending on the size or location uh, of this sewage treatment plant. That's why it doesn't necessarily mean one sewage treatment plant will have a particular capacity to uh, to treat the water, uh, the waste. I'm sorry, the wastewater and that. So that's one of the things that we need to address, and that's, that's some things that we need to accept. So sometimes there will be sewage treatment plants that will be more efficient, and there will be some sewage treatment plants that will cost more to treat the water. And again, uh, for sanitation coverage, what we are providing is once every five years. Uh, Two concessionaires are required, or they are required at no additional cost to provide sanitation and dislodging services to all their consumers. So these are their targets. If you notice, the actual sanitation coverage uh, is actually lower than the target. The reason behind this is the lack of, I would say that the lack of incentive for to cons the consumers to avail of the services of the two concessionaires or basically they don't want to have their septic tanks dislodged because of various reasons. Sometimes they don't want to do it because of the lack of awareness, or they don't know where their septic tank is located, or they don't want to be bothered. So those are the things that we are facing, and uh, we hope to address that by uh, providing things in the future. What else are we doing uh, to incentivize uh, Based the two concessionaires to increase uh, and to create more, to build more sewage treatment plant. What we recently did is we did a new water program in the Manila side of Metro Manila or the Western portion. This is actually the first drinkable reuse water. This is a direct potable reuse where it's basically from the sewage treatment plant, the effluent will go directly to a treatment plant, mobile water treatment plant, and directly provide serve the water to the consumers, unlike in an indirect treatment plant, where they will, the sewage treatment plant effluent will go first to a body of water, like uh, it will be injected in a groundwater or an aquifer or some uh, another reservoir, and then it will be extracted. So, the Philippines is actually only the third country in the world that is doing this. The first one is Namibia in Africa. The second is the United States. And the Philippines is the third one and the first in Asia to adopt this direct potable reuse. Why are we doing this? The plan is this is actually an incentive for uh, Manila Water and Manila to be able to reach their last mile. Basically, the problem right now is we, while we are already at 94% uh, water coverage, it's actually the last mile that's really difficult. It's the areas are really hard to go to because they're really in, uh, at the farthest portions of Metro Manila already, like uh, like Parnaque, Pasay, Alabang, Cavite. Uh, these are the areas that are really far from the water source. So these new water plants, new, new water, where they will reuse water, uh, will be able to provide water at these areas. So this actually will en encourage us, Manila Water and Manila, to build more sewage treatment plant 
and they could just put a uh, mobile treatment plant inside that uh, sewage treatment plant, and they will be able to provide additional water to their customers. So this will address the last mile uh, problem of providing water. And these are the future plans of additional new water in the rest of Metro Manila. We're hoping to provide uh, around 600,000 people with addition, uh, to be uh, provided new water. These are around more than 100 MLD by 2029. What else are we doing uh, to encourage people to avail of the services uh, and uh, for people to be aware of what is happening? We uh, we went to a social through a social media campaign on sewage and sanitation. We had this all this campus awareness drive on water and sewage, and we have this uh, award where we recognize the local government units that help us in promoting the sludging services. Because uh, as I presented earlier, the availment rate really was is low. Actually, during the COVID pandemic, it went down to around 50%. Half of Metro Manila are, are not uh, availing of their uh, this, this lodging services, which they have already paid for because it's part of their bill. It's part of the environmental charge and they don't need to pay extra. But despite that, uh, despite the fact that they have already paid for this and they don't need to pay extra, they don't want to avail of it. So we tap the local government units to encourage them, to encourage their constituents to avail of this dislodging services. So because of this, we we are able to increase the availment rate to a higher rate. I think right now we are at 80%. So that's one of the in, in, uh, initiatives that the RO is doing in order to increase awareness and to convince people to have their septic tanks dislodged and help clean the environment. Lastly, all of this in order for the Metro Manila to achieve citywide inclusive sanitation. It's not just one, uh, there's no magic bullet. There's no one answer to everything, but this is our basically what we are doing right now in order to achieve this. We are providing innovative solutions. We are tariff impact by providing additional uh, additional incentives to the concessionaires by allowing them to recover. Uh, of course, public-private partnership and social ac acceptability because we need all of these things in order for us to be able to achieve citywide inclusive sanitation. And that's it. Thank you. Next slide. Thank you very much. Uh, if you have any questions, um, here to answer. Thank you very much, Patrick. Very strong and informative presentation, interesting perspectives and um, detailed facts. Uh, thank you very much. And this presentation brings to an end um, our presentations for today's uh, webinar, and we're going to move to our short Q&A session. I want to invite all our panelists to put their cameras on. Thank you very much. Uh, and I have one question that I would invite all of our panelists to answer shortly, uh, maybe in the same order as presenting. The question is, what are some of the incentives that we can give to utilities or service providers to ensure inclusive quality and sustainable service provision? Thank you. Maybe Suraj can come first if he has an uh, answer for that. Uh, what we are doing is the first uh, is, to, is to provide them a financial incentive. We allow them to increase their tariff adjustments, of course, in exchange for performance. That's why the tariff adjustment of uh, the environmental charge in Metro Manila is tied to the performance of the two concessionaires. They need to increase their sewer coverage in order they, for them to be able to increase their environmental charge. Thank you very much, Patrick. Anybody else wants to add anything? Uh, yes, Rikia, if, if I may. Um, of course. Thank you, Mai. Yes, in, in the Philippines, it's it's very clear. The, the incentive is, uh, is money, right? Because it's a private-run system. But in most of the developing world, in particular to Southeast Asia, South Asia, it's Africa, uh, Latin America. These are mostly public-run systems. So the incentives are different. Uh, and, and the incentive is not really, of course, the money, but uh, it it's supposed to be good governance, which is a, an incentive in itself, uh, that they are able to deliver uh, the, the, the services 
the public and that they get re-elected as a as a result, right? Um, and, and this is, I think, the, the big difference between public and private run systems because th there's not amount of money on the tariff side that can incentivize uh, public run systems. Public run systems always, uh, you can't do a full cost recovery in most cases because it will be quite prohibitive, especially in, in the far-flung areas, not maybe in, in metropolises and, and city centers, but in uh, rural areas, and, and it will be very difficult. Um, so I, I would think that other forms of incentives have to be put, uh, maybe having clearer, not incentive per se, but clearer targets uh, that they need to achieve year on year, uh, understanding how much that will cost. And if government will not allow full cost recovery, that government will pick up the tab by way of gap funding. Um, and that is the only way uh, that public utilities will be able to, to meet uh, service obligations, the way that Metro Manila private <laughs> entities were private companies were able to meet that obligation. Thank you. Can I add something else? Uh, I also want to mention about uh, what we are doing, uh, as I've as I shown in my presentation. Uh, in order for us to get the assistance of the local government unions, we also did some recognition. So it's a cheap form of uh, it's, a, it's a cheap form of carrot for them. Yeah. We give them an award, uh, and that they are recognized, and they normally use this actually uh, to show that they are performing well. So <laughs> that's something that you can look into by recognizing them. Thank you very much for the answers. Uh, we have a few questions now in our Q and A box. I'm gonna try to go through as many as possible, uh, timing allowed. Uh, one of them is uh, what water quality parameters are set for sewage treated uh, reused drinking water and, uh, and what was the response from customers after they uh, found out it is from sewage to drinking? <laughs> okay, I think that's fine. Uh, for the new water, this is a direct portable reuse, what we are doing. Uh, the parameter is that for the sewage, it has to meet the, the Department of Environmental uh, environment standard for effluent water, then it will go directly to a water treatment plant that will treat it in that will that the parameter should comply with the Philippine national standard for drinking water. So we constantly monitor this and make sure that this pass the parameters that uh, that make sure that it's safe and potable. Now, what are the response from consumers? Uh, we are still monitoring that, but so far, I'm crossing my fingers, no complaints no reports of any problems at all. We started last October and we're, we're, we're on our fourth month right now and things are looking good because there's some water interruption in their area and all the, the ones that are given this reuse water, this new water, have water 24 hours and they have no water service interruptions. So that's an incentive for them not to complain actually. <laughs> This is very positive. Thank you for answering this uh, important matter. Uh, we have a question for Suresh. Uh, can you please elaborate on the need for having a regulator uh, to deliver inclusive sanitation services? I think uh, uh, there is a need to have regulation because it, this is an interlinked aspect of, uh, and related to governance of, and it's a public ser service delivery, uh, what we're looking at. So that's why regulations interplay is important. Uh, however, uh, regulations need to catch up with the uh, new set of uh, formulations required to ultimately achieve this. Because in the past, the regulations have been uh, restricted to only one aspect of water management, which needs to expand the ambit and, and take up uh, other interconnectedness of uh, citywide sanitation aspects. If you look at the sanitation per se, the definition itself is uh, interconnected. So I think there is a, a dire need of connect, having regulations uh, and uh, move to a larger definition of environmental sanitation, actually, not just sanitation to FSM. And then because this also needs connects with the uh, you know, uh, the water security aspects. So if there are in the past regulations for uh, water supply and then operations have been uh, based on that, now there is more a need as uh, Patrick's experience saying that where they are trying to bring in uh, the, you know, 
uh, the toilet to tap, you can say, uh, the sewage to uh, water to, to uh, tap. And I, I wanted to also add on to what Patrick had mentioned. Overall, uh, across the global south, uh, actually, if you see the rate of sewage treatment, uh, the percentage of sewage treatment is very less. So in, in, in general, people do consume the, uh, you know, or the uh, water supply, water suppliers, whether it is public sector or private sector, do pick up the water from the sources, which are actually uh, somebody's, uh, they live, uh, they pick up from somewhere downstream in the river, and that is sewage, actually. Uh, you, you would say that all the sources of water supply are carrying sewage. And in one way or the other way, uh, you, uh, you can, uh, you, uh, Patrick is very, bold to announce that you know they are taking this bold step to supply the treated sewage but in a way if you for example i've spent a lot of time in india i know that every city is downstream downstream of somebody and then the water supply agencies actually pick up the sewage it is the sewage of the upstream city which comes and becomes the source of water supply and then the water supply treatment plants treat it and supply it back uh, more or less every city does that in one way or the other way, uh, increasingly now. I'm sure Muid will also give the same examples. I'll stop here, thank you. Thank you very much, Suresh. Uh, I'm gonna go to the next question. We have quite a few now. Uh, how decentralized systems are achieving quality-based treatment compared to centralized? Also, OPEX to those system, are they in normal family budgets? Well, I mean, thank you so much, Zika, uh, for giving me the opportunity. You see the uh, the centralized uh, system or decentralized system. This is not the factor. The factor is what the country needs. I mean, the, whether it is the Southeast Asian countries or Asian countries or African countries. The point is, I we all, always agree that the centralized system may be maybe the best solution. But if you consider the I mean, I mean the resources that require for, to establish the centralized system is very high. It takes time, longer time to establish that. Whereas the service of decentralization, then decentralized, it's not the system, it's not the technology. Decentralization means decentralized authority, decentralized responsibility, decentralized accountability, decentralized resourcing. When we give the you know small, small parts, it becomes easier and it is time saving. Now the point is whether we really consider to save our time, whether we have enough time for the journey of safely managed sanitation, uh, or we want to achieve the safely managed sanitation and with the same outcome, with this, you know, uh, but uh, keeping the time frame within the limit of 2030 and within the limited resources. Decision is ours, but definitely, as I mentioned, the you know that's a choice. But the some cities, some cities like very urban populated city like Dhaka city, mega city uh, in Bangladesh or in other countries also, the centralization is a prerequisite sort of thing. But in addition, it's a parallel sort of journey that needs to require for the sanitation like decentralization and centralization both. But in other small towns, still now decentralized way is the best way to reach the SDG 6.2. That's the opinion. Over to you, Sika. Thank uh, you very I much, think. Dr. Muit. I think we have time just for one more question. And because we have quite a few, I'm just going to go for the next question in order, um, which is for uh, Mr. Patrick T. Who is paying the environmental charge? Is it everyone? Uh, regardless of the service being provided, for example, a seco to sewage system or FSM, is the environmental charge being charged through the water bill? And could you share the results of the implementation of the uh, penalty system you have mentioned, please? Thank you very much. Okay, uh, what we, the environmental charge is part of the water bill of all consumers. So, because the, remember, you need to, when you treat water, it goes to the environment and everyone's affected. So we also want it to be affordable because uh, we want to subsidize the providing of the dislodge, especially to the consumers who are the low income households in Metro Manila. So that's why we made it a one basket principle. So the higher consumers will subsidize the low income households and low consumers. And this will be part of their water bill. So that's how we are we are able to do it, and 
uh, I think it's working. Uh, a lot of people, majority of the, the low income households are being subsidized, not just for wastewater, but also in their water consumption. So that's the case. Uh, and wait, sorry, what's the second question? Is there a second question? Uh, there was a could you uh, could you share uh, results of implementation of penalty uh, systems? Oh, the penalties. Uh, for the penalties, uh, what we did recently is that if there's any problem with the service of Manila Water and May or May Milad, we will impose financial penalties on them, and this amount will be rebated to consumers. And this amount cannot be recovered by the two concessionaires. This will incentivize them to perform better and provide the proper service to their cons consumers. If not, they need to rebate a certain amount to consumers depending on what they fail to achieve or what if they fail to achieve any uh, service obligation or if they fail to comply with any of their service obligations, then they will, we will be penalizing them. We, we started penalizing them just during my term before there were no penalties. I hope that Thank answers you. the question. I think it does. Thank you very much, Patrick. Uh, we have quite a few more questions, but unfortunately we don't have more time for any more. Thank you to all our um, uh, participants for sending the questions. We we would try to answer in writing and um, we'll share your questions to our panelists and uh, get back to you in writing in the next couple of weeks. Um, I would like to give the floor to my floor from Waterlinks for some closing remarks. Thank you, thank you, Sikia, and and thank, thank you, you to thank you to the panelists for such an engaging uh, presentation, and thank you to the participants as well for being actively participating and listening to us over the last hour and a half. Um, I think quite a lot uh, has been discussed, but quite a lot clearly needs to be further discussed. Um, but I go back to a few points, uh, to the point of, of Suresh, uh, that regulation can really contribute to improved services. Uh, we are not saying here that one must have a regulator uh, in order to, to assure services, but it certainly can help. Uh, Patrick, T from Manila has clearly shown how regulation has uh, greatly improved services in my home city of uh, Metro Manila um, from when it was run uh, by the government uh, till, till now. Um, why is regulation needed? Primarily to balance the interest uh, of both the operator and the, the consumer. Uh, and even in public run systems, I we say that this is needed because even the public operator needs to ensure that he has enough funds to deliver the services. And this is always the problem in public run systems where the operator is stuck with a very artificially low tariff and therefore he is not able to deliver the services that is needed by customers. Um, regulation, I feel, can balance that. As mentioned in the case of India, they are very clear in the state of Odisha that we do not need full cost recovery, but they understand what the gap fund is. The regulator can be that person who can then identify in all cities that are being uh, provided services by public run systems to determine that gap funding, to ensure that the utilities have the wherewithal to deliver these services. Um, to the point of, uh, of Dr. Muid, um, there is uh, decentralized or centralized, it's really up to you. It depends on the city, it depends on the situation. In large cities, obviously, like Metro Manila, like, uh, like Kuala Lumpur, uh, like Delhi, obviously you need uh, sewerage. But in rural areas or even sub-metropolises, maybe it is not needed. Um, Bangladesh is, is trying to look into how to go about it. Uh, and they are giving themselves a very strict period of up to 2030. So good luck uh, to that. Um, I also would like to say 
that um, we have a lot here going uh, in terms of, uh, for those of you who want to continue the discussion, IWA and its new initiative uh, will uh, certainly be able to assist. So please continue to be active in that. The FSM cells that are present in several countries, Bangladesh included, as Dr. Muid had presented, supported by uh, the Gates Foundation, uh, they have a wide range of uh, information and data for those of you who are interested in further um, learning about this and contributing uh, towards really achieving CYs for each of our countries. So with that, I give it back to Sikia. Thank you once again to IWA for inviting us to, co to collaborate with you on this uh, webinar. Thank you very much, Mai, for the closing remarks. Uh, I would like to thank all our panelists and participants for being with us today. I think we can all agree that it, that was a very informative session. Uh, just to close, I would like to um, uh, announce our upcoming webinar uh, of IWA, which is Water Safety Planning. Um, and um, also the next webinar we have uh, in one of our specialist group is empowering uh, women in water perspectives from the African regions. Uh, we'll be very happy if our participants join for these two webinars. Um, and um, also we have, um, we, we're going to participate uh, in Abidjan, in uh, Cote d'Ivoire, AFA and FSM, uh, Congre uh, FSM 7 Congress uh, with few technical sessions and uh, workshops. Uh, you can read about them on our screen at the moment. Thank you very much. If you want to join IWA, there's a 20% discount until 31st of December uh, 2023 uh, by using the code that you can see on, on your screen. With that, I want to say uh, to, to wish a good day ahead or lovely evening, depending on where you are. And thank you for being with us. Goodbye. <laughs>